Hi class, I can't make it on Monday. We just merged our material science and engineering department with the metallurgy department. This is really, really exciting news. Um, and there's a big meeting of all the material science uni uh, departments around the country, what's called the University Materials Council, and I'm going to represent our department. So I can't be there on class on Monday, but we have to cover some stuff in order to be ready for the exam. So we're gonna do this um, via video. I'll post it on YouTube and you can watch it anytime you'd like. You don't need to come to class on Monday because I won't be there. So our learning objectives are as follows. We're going to define and calculate linear density. We will discuss close packing and can basically we're going to compare and contrast single versus uh, crystal, single crystal versus polycrystal in samples and what difference do you get in properties. We will talk about um, the most important thing, which is X-ray diffraction and how we can use that to determine crystal structure. Um, things like lattice parameter, how does the lattice parameter and the X-ray diffraction relate to the different inner planar spacings, right? These cause the peaks that you observe in diffraction, so we'll describe all of that. To do that, we're going to have to introduce Bragg's Law, so we'll explain what is Bragg's Law and why does it let us calculate crystal structure. And at the very end of class, we'll talk about the structure, or really the lack thereof, for glassy materials or amorphous materials. So last time that we were talking, we were discussing planar density. Planar density, we basically said, okay, you can take these structures like BCC and FCC, you can slice a cube through them, uh, a plane through them, and you could draw the atoms that the plane intersects. And last time we did it for the 110 plane, that's these red planes. And we said that even though they intersect atoms a little bit differently in this case, they happen just by chance to have the exact same number of atoms per plane. You had one quarter times four of those times one quarter, and then one in the center, that was two atoms over here. And over here you had the one fourth times one fourth, but you had two times a half, and it ended up to be two atoms per plane. So these ones happen to be the same, what we call planar density, the number of atoms divided by the area of the plane. Since they're the same area, they ended up having the same planar density. What about this purple plane? First off, what plane would that be? Okay, we go through our steps. We pick an origin. Let's pick that back corner. It intersects X, Y, and Z at 1. So it's the 1, 1, 1 plane. Well, let's draw that plane and see where the atoms are. Okay, on that one, it's going to be triangular. Let's draw it. It's going to intersect atoms at the corners. It's also going to intersect those atoms along the faces. And so you end up with something like that. Now, the planar density on this 111 plane is higher than the 110. So we would say that the planar density for the 111 is greater than the planar density for the 100. Mathematically, we could show that. We could add up the atoms here, and we'd say, okay, there's half, 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 so we're at 1.5 atoms. Then you've got a sixth, a sixth, and a sixth. So you still have two atoms per plane, but this plane, the planal area, is smaller. This is root 2 times a on all the sides. And so you could figure out the area of that triangle. It would be 1 half base times height. And you would see that you actually have a higher planar density along this 111 plane than you do the 110 plane, which was up here. Why do we care about this? We care about this because this influences other properties. For example, atoms are going to slide past each other and slip when, things to, when we start to apply stresses to them. And the way that they move is dictated by the highest planar density. So we'll come back to that in a few chapters. Now, the other thing that we didn't learn about last class we ran out of time for was this idea of linear density. Linear density is the exact same thing. You pick a structure, and this time, instead of calculating the number of atoms centered on a plane, we're going to calculate the number of atoms on a direction, right? Divide that by the length of the direction. So, for example, if we have a nice simple cubic structure, so atoms on the corners like that, we could calculate the linear density, right? The linear density along different directions. We could say, for example, this linear density right here. What's the linear density? Well, it intersects two atoms, and it does so two atoms by going root two over A. Meanwhile, what about this one? Well, that one it intersects two atoms, but it does it by going a distance of just A. So they have different linear densities, and all you do is just calculate the number of atoms centered on that direction divided by the length of that direction. Okay. Now, earlier this uh, class, we talked about how many of these metal structures are close-packed, meaning they just want to get as close together as they can. And we even said that HCP and FCC, that's hexagonal close-packed, and face-centered cubic, are surprisingly related to one another. If you take and you make a hexagonal arrangement of atoms, that's this white layer. We'll call that white layer, and we're going to label it A. Okay, 
when you put that layer down and then you want to stack a next layer on top of it, you have options. You have options on where you put that next layer. For example, see this little spot here? That's your triangle up spot, and this looks like a triangle pointing down. You can choose to put it either on the triangle up, or you could put it on the triangle down. But as you can see, they would overlap if you tried to put it on both of those spots on the same layer. So you can't. You have to pick one or the other. So if for your B layer, that's the next layer up, if you choose to put it, in this case over here, it looks like they put it on the triangle down spot. Those were triangle down positions before. They put their B atoms on the triangle down spots. Then you go to your next layer up. If you go back to where you were initially, back to the A spot, you get hexagonal close packed. But if this was triangle down, triangle down, triangle down, if instead of going back to your initial A spot, which would be this one here in the dashed white line, if instead you put your next layer on what would have been a triangle up spot, it's a different site, and this leads to face-centered cubic. Okay, So lots of metals can be described in terms of their packing, and this is a clever way to visualize that. Um, and there's a couple more that I've shown here that might be helpful for showing it. Okay. Other structures also can be found in close-packed types of structures. For example, um, sodium chloride, NaCl, we know that that's just two interpenetrating FCC lattices, so it's close-packing where you put together two FCCs, but there's lots of other structures that can be formed this way. Okay? Now there's something that we've talked about kind of at length in this class, that you can have single crystals where all the atoms are perfectly oriented all the way through this, the substance, or you can have polycrystalline materials. Now, single crystalline materials, that means that you can have a material like this where it has some, it's a crystal and it has some sort of shape to it, which is due to the shape of the atoms going all the way through it. Like the arrangement, the unit cells are all perfectly lined up all the way through. And so what you're seeing here, the faces of this cube are literally, well, it's not a cube, but these are facets. These are crystalline faces. Like they are like, I don't know if they're the 100, the 111, whatever they are, we'd have to figure it out for this crystal. But those are the faces of the crystal you're seeing, and it's all organized. Here's a cubic one. This is iron pyrite. It's a nice cube, meaning all the way through here, all those little unit cell lattices are lined up and oriented in the exact same way. Now, that's the exception. Most of the time, materials are not single crystalline because you have to basically crystallize just one unit cell and then slowly grow outwards from there. And, they all, and that way, they'll all be lined up. Let's say that you crystallize a bunch of different ones in different spots. They're all going to grow, and when they grow together, now you've got that divide between them, and that's a grain boundary. And it's much, much more common to grow materials like that. Like the metal that you see like in this mug, this metal, this aluminum, is definitely polycrystalline. It's a bunch of tiny little grains. They're so small you can't see them with your eye, typically. Although if you look at a lamp post and you know it's got that kind of spangly pattern of metal, have you ever noticed that on a big lamp post? Those are actually grains of the zinc from hot dipped galvanized steel, right? The lamp post is steel, they dip it in zinc, and you're seeing those grains that have grown on the surface, which is pretty rad, okay? So who cares? Who cares about this? If it's got grains, if it doesn't have grains, who cares? First off, grain ones, they look kind of neat. You've got these nice faceted faces that you see in here. If you saw the documentary uh, Planet Earth, you saw them go into the, the cave Lechugia, which had massive single crystals, so they can grow quite large. But in practice, growing them large is very difficult. Um, we do it in the semiconductor industry. For every phone that you've got has, um, in has materials inside of it, uh, like transistors and that, and you have to have very perfect silicon to make those. So we can do it if we need to, but most of the time it's really hard. Now, something that also happens is that you get very different properties depending on whether your material is single crystalline or not. So we can see this maybe most easily in comparing diamond versus graphite. Diamond and graphite are both just carbon, right? But in diamond, it's a three-dimensional structure. The atoms are all bonded to one another in three dimensions, and it's cubic. Whereas in graphite, it's not bonded to everything. They're bonded in layers. Like, this is the graphite structure. You have layers that are bonded quite tightly in these layers, in these hexagonal layers. But between those layers, it's just van der Waals forces. And that means that you have very different properties, say, in this direction going up and down, as opposed to left to right in that plane. This is why you can take a pencil, and a pencil is just graphite. That little tip of the pencil is graphite. And I can slide it over a piece of paper, and I can leave a mark on it really easily, because 
I'm sliding it and it's dragging and separating these layers of atoms from one another really easily. But if you tried to break these layers, it's actually quite strong. That's graphene. Each one of these layers is graphene. That's a pretty strong molecule. Um, on the other hand, diamond, if this was diamond, uh, which is, this is the diamond structure, if this was graphite here, it's bonded in all three dimensions. And so diamond is a very strong material. It's actually the hardest material we know of is diamond. And it's because of this difference in bonding. So we would say that diamond, this cubic structure, it doesn't matter the direction you measure it in. It's basically, it's, it's, it is what we call isotropic. The properties don't depend on the direction. But graphite is something that we would say is anisotropic because if you measured, say, thermal properties, thermal conductivity in this direction, it's quite low. But if you measure thermal conductivity in this plane, it's almost as high as diamond, and diamond is the highest that there is, right? So you get very different properties depending on the direction that you measure it, okay? Single crystal materials tend to be anisotropic. If it's a cubic structure, it might not be, but they tend to be anisotropic, meaning if you measure it in different facets of the crystal, you get different properties. This thing here, if I measured it in different directions, I'd probably get one set of properties if I measured it up and down, and a different set of properties if I measured it left and right, okay? That's anisotropy, if a property depends on the direction of the crystal. Now, polycrystalline materials, do you think they're going to be anisotropic or isotropic? Well, they're going to tend to be isotropic because even though you've got a bunch of individual crystals that might be anisotropic, when you put them together, they're all randomly oriented. So maybe you've got like your crystals look like this. They're all technically anisotropic, all your crystals. But because they're randomly oriented every which way, it has an overall averaging effect. Now, we can make a polycrystalline act anisotropic if we line these things up a little bit. Now, if they were perfectly lined up, it'd be a single crystalline. But if they're just sort of mostly lined up, like I'm drawing here, then we call that textured. If it's textured, we went from this nice random orientation and we lined them up, the textured sample will be much more anisotropic, right? Sometimes we do this by design. For example, with ferroelectric materials, magnetic materials, we typically line those things up to make them behave like single crystals without having to grow of a single crystal, which is much harder, okay? So that's anisotropy in polycrystalline versus single crystalline materials. Okay, finally we get to the good stuff for this chapter, which is determining crystal structure with diffraction. The podcast you listened to this had some of this backstory, so some of this you'll heard before, and now we're going to get into the math a little bit. So in the podcast you learned that in the early days, when they would try and figure out, you know, what on earth is the crystal structure of these different things, all they could do is look at, like, the angles between them and sort of guess, well, what type of crystal structure could produce these angles. And that was not very good. Um, that was really hard, and they didn't get very far doing that. But then they said well, there's a better way to do this. And it happened at the turn of the 20th century. There was a guy named Wilhelm C. Röntgen, and he discovers the X-ray. And it's amazing, right? Uh, X-rays are just a form of light, right? Just like you can see that this red laser point is a type of light. Well, X-rays are just a type of light. They have a much shorter wavelength, though. The wavelength of red light, right, is something like 500 nanometers, something somewhere around there. But X-rays are much smaller. Instead of being nanometer scale, they're angstrom scale, meaning they're basically the same size as the atoms in your molecules. And if they're the same size, if the, if the wavelength of light is basically the same as the separation distance of atoms, that means that they can be scattered by atoms. If they can be scattered, we can observe that scattering and we can try and infer what must be happening. And that's what they did here. So it all started with the discovery of X-rays by Wilhelm C. Röntgen. What's amazing, the dude wins the Nobel Prize in 1901, and he gives all the money for the prize, which is a lot of money, to his university, and he refuses to take a patent out on the material because he's like, he knew that this was such an important scientific discovery that lots of people would benefit by using this technology. Imagine if we did that more today. If every time that a discovery happened, instead of commercializing it and patenting it and saying, no one else can use this without paying me, you know, we're going to make the world a better place by opening it up. It's pretty cool. I don't know if you'd see that today. It's pretty rare. About a decade later... Will, William Bragg and his son, Bragg and Bragg is his father-son combination, they win a Nobel Prize in 1915 by using x-rays to do what's called x-ray diffraction. Now, what on earth is x-ray diffraction? First, let's remind ourselves what diffraction is. Diffraction, since you have waves, waves can be scattered, right? So they only get scattered if the wavelength of the wave is commensurate with the object it's hitting. 
Or in other words, if you've got a wavelength that's really long, like radio waves, radio waves don't scatter atoms, right? That's why they can pass right through us and through buildings and walls and even some mountains and stuff, because they don't get scattered by it. They're too long. Meanwhile, x-rays are really, really small, and so they get scattered off of atoms, okay? Think about a beach. At the beach, you've got waves coming in and hitting the beach, crashing on the beach. Now, the waves that hit the beach maybe have, I don't know, 20-foot wavelengths or something like that. But they're going to hit a bunch of small things like seaweed and little grains of sand and rocks, and they don't scatter off of those because they're much, much bigger. But if that wave hits a lighthouse and you looked down on it from the sky, you might see something like this, right? If there's two lighthouses next to each other at these two plus spots, the waves coming in would produce a scattering ring around them. And if you have two of them, then they're going to scatter and interfere with one another. You can have destructive interference along these lines see these where there's basically like the wave pattern disappears or you can have constructive interference you can have destructive or, or destructive so there you've got constructive going outward this was the basis of the famous double slit experiment when they shined light and they had uh, a slit in the wall that was small enough that was on the wavelength of the light they started seeing diffraction right they saw these extra like fringes and they're like what on earth is happening and that led them to realize oh it must be constructive and destructive interference so let's define these really quick with a quick drawing. Let's imagine you've got constructive interference. Constructive interference means your radiation coming in looks like this. Okay? And at first, let's say there's two wavelengths of light, or there's one wavelength, but there's two particles of light, photons, right next to each other, and they're lined up. Then you undergo a scattering event. If after the scattering event they are still lined up, Right? If they're still the same in phase, same wavelength, then what that results is is just an extra high amplitude wavelength. It's the same. It's the same wavelength. It just has a larger amplitude. Okay, that's constructive interference. But the opposite is possible. Right. So you've got your wavelengths coming in. Okay, and initially they are what we say is in phase. Right. They're lined up. When one goes up, the other one goes up. Okay? But after the scattering event, now they look like this. Okay? And what that leads to is nothing. Right? They completely scatter and, and cancel each other out. This is called destructive interference. That's what you see in this picture up here. Right? You see regions where there's no waves at all and regions where the waves got really large, and regions kind of in between, okay? That's constructive versus destructive interference. So Bragg and them, what they realized, and this is so clever, is they said, oh, if that can happen, can we, can use, can we use that to figure out what the separation distance must have been in the, in the different lattices? Because if you figure that out, and then you measure on different sides and things like that, you could figure out what the structure must have been. That was kind of the idea behind what they did, which is pretty incredible. So here's how it works. We have to make... Uh, two assumptions, two important assumptions. First, is that the radiation coming in has all the same wavelength. Okay, so over here, take a look here. You've got you've got three different waves of light: one, two, and three. They all have to have the same wavelength, and they do. These all have the same wavelength lambda. Now, the second assumption, the second assumption is that they're all running parallel to one another. Right? If they were diverging, that messes this experiment up. So let's assume that they're perfectly parallel. They're just next to each other, so they take up some physical separation distance, but they're all the same wavelength and parallel. When they hit their sample, they're going to hit it at different spots. Like, look at this first one. It hits that first layer, right? Let's look at the next one. It, it gets to the same point where the first one was, and then it has to travel an extra distance. See that? It has to travel an extra half wavelength, and then it hits another atom and it scatters. Well, look at this one. It has to travel a whole extra wavelength before it, ha before it hits an atom, and then it scatters, and it comes out. So what we're really looking at is this extra distance from here to here along this dotted line. There's this extra distance that waves have to travel. If the waves are right next to each other, they go in, one might hit, the other one keeps on going, and it's going to travel some extra distance, which we call a path length. And then when it comes out, we have to ask whether or not these things are in phase with each other anymore. 
right? So this one's going to come out like this, but this one is as well, and this one is as well. So they would still be in phase. If they're in phase, we would see this wave. It would come out as constructive interference. We'd see a peak at that angle, theta, with some separation distance between planes, which we're going to call d, h, k, l. Okay? Or in other words, let's zoom in on this a little bit and take a look at what's happening here. Light comes in. They were going the same distance up until that dashed line, but then the lower one has to travel an extra distance, that path length, and geometrically you could solve this, that that path length that it travels is d times the sine of theta, the same theta that you came in at. It's going to travel one path length, two path lengths. So it's going to be an additional 2d sine of theta that it has to travel. It's going to travel that much extra distance. So what Bragg did, and this is so amazing, he realized, okay, if this extra distance that they travel is equal to any integer of our wavelength, then you'll get constructive interference. If it's anything else, you won't get constructive interference. You'll get destructive interference, and you shouldn't see anything. In other words, let's say you've got your source and your detector. The source comes in, the radiation is coming in, okay? It hits your sample, and you're going to detect whether a, symbol, uh, a signal is there in the end. And you're just going to change the angle. You're going to start at a low angle, and you're going to get higher and higher, and you just measure at what points you see diffraction occur. You know the two theta at that value. You can figure out what the interplanar spacing must be using Bragg's law, right? Which again says that the wavelength is equal to 2d, which is a hkl, it's a function of hkl, the planes involved, which I'll show you in a moment, times sine theta, okay? Now, how do, you f how do we figure out this d value? Like, that's not trivial. Well, you could come back to um, our crystal structures, and we could start drawing some of them. So, for example, let's take the FCC crystal structure. There's the 001 plane, and in this VESTA file, which you have access to and you can plot it yourself, you can see that there's these purple planes. Those are a bunch of 100 planes, and you can see that they're separated by a lattice parameter, right? There's one unit cell. They are separated by one lattice parameter, okay? But that exact same structure, if you look at the 111 structure, or the 111 family of planes, their separation distance is different. See, there's our, our lattice. That would be the lattice parameter right there from here to here. But what we see is that it is a smaller separation distance. It's less than a lattice parameter, right? It's less. It's maybe like a third or something-ish. Well, we could figure it out. And then if you do like the 311, it's going to be different too. It's going to be even smaller. So this is an even smaller separation distance. So what we need is we need a, a slick little tool that will let us calculate what is the separation distance for any plane as a function of the HKL values. By the way, this is why we learned our Miller indices. HKL to describe a plane turns out to be the same HKL that we use with tables like this that give us the interplanar spacing. So D sub HKL that is the inner planar spacing. That's the thing we need to know in Bragg's law. And for any of the seven different crystal systems, we can solve this inner planar spacing if you know the HKL values and the lattice parameter. So cubic, for example, if you want to know the HKL or the, the inner planar spacing, we want to know D HKL for the 100 plane for cubic, well we could just plug it in. HKL, we plug in 1, 0, 0, so it's going to be 1 squared plus 0 squared plus 0 squared all over the lattice parameter squared equals 1 over d squared. So 1 over d squared equals 1 over a squared when you plug in 1, 0, 0, which is why d just equaled the lattice parameter for the 1, 0, 0 plane. But it is not the case for the 1, 1, 1. Right? For the 1, 1, 1, then it's 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared, so it's 3 over a squared equals 1 over d squared. So it's going to be a different value. It's going to be smaller than the lattice parameter. So that's how you use these tables. You'd have to plug in the HKL for the different family of planes, and out comes the inner planar spacing. Once you have the inner planar spacing, you know the wavelength, maybe. Let's assume that you're using a wavelength that you know what it is.
you can plug in the interplanar spacing, and you can calculate the angle at which you would expect to see diffraction. And what's cool is that Vesta does this for you. So um, if you've got Vesta, go to Utilities, and under Utilities there's this one, Powder Diffraction Pattern. It will simulate what the diffraction pattern which should look like for any of these structures. Okay, So we pull this one up. Under Conditions, there's under Source, it has two different types of wavelength, and they're really close, 1.5405, and 1.5443, really close to each other. What's happening here is that you start out with copper radiation, but it's really hard to just excite it and get a single transition. So instead, it's you very often get two or more, and we try and filter them. So let's say we filtered it and we got it down to one wavelength, exactly the copper radiation. Now we can calculate it, and voila, you end up with a table like this of all the different HKL values of your reflections, the D spacing, the two theta where you would observe this, and it even tells you the approximate intensity. Or in other words, it generates this plot. It says your most intense peak happens right here at like 43 degrees. You, then your next most intense and your second peak happens at 50 degrees. Your third one happens at like 75 or something. So that is a pretty slick way to do to go about uh, figuring out diffraction for these things, okay? Now, let's see. Let's do a sample uh, calculation of this. So, the question says the following. What D spacing in angstrom, by the way, since I'm not in class, these clicker questions won't be counted, so you don't need to worry about trying to get credit for them. It says, what D spacing in angstroms would you expect for the 211 plane in a tetragonal crystal system where A and C are given? So we're told HKL, we're told it's tetragonal, and we're given A and C. So in this table up above, we could look up the formula for relating inner planar spacing to HKL for the tetragonal system. It's right there. I'm going to write it down below. I'm going to write it a, a slightly simpler form, which is mathematically equivalent, which is 1 over d squared, and d is a function of hkl, is equal to h squared plus k squared over a squared plus l squared over c squared. That's mathematically identical to what's written above, okay? So we can just plug things in. This is going to be then equal to 4 squared plus 1 squared over 3.644 squared plus 1 squared over 5.201 squared. When I plug all of that in, let's find out what we get. Remember that's d squared, 1 over d squared over here, so you have to account for that square when you do it. When I plug all that in, I get... I get that D should be 1.555 angstroms. Okay, So you can solve for the interplanar spacing, and then if you knew what the wavelength of your radiation was, you could use Bragg's Law and you could say, oh, okay, since it's copper K-alpha radiation or whatever, we know the radiation, we know the D spacing, you know, 2, so you can solve for theta. You can figure out the exact angle where you'd expect to see that diffraction peak, which is pretty cool. Now, just because you satisfy Bragg's Law doesn't always guarantee that you're going to get diffraction. You have to at least satisfy Bragg's Law, but atoms, diffraction depends on where the atoms are in the lattice, right? So it's not just the interplanar spacing, it depends on where the atoms are in that layer. And because of that, you end up with special rules for diffraction. We're just going to give you two of them in this class. You don't have to know where they came from. You could, we're going to learn about them later if you take um, a materials characterization course. For this class, you just have to accept these rules as given. And they are the following. That for the body-centered cubic, BCC, in order to get diffraction, you have to have H plus K plus L equal an even number. Otherwise, you don't get diffraction. But for FCC, H, K, and L have to all be either even numbers or they all have to be odd numbers. Okay? So again, just take that as given for this class, where that comes from. So now, now we can do cool things. For example, take this clicker question. It says, for FCC gold, the lattice constant is given, 4.078 angstroms. And the question is, at what two theta value would you observe the third peak 
starting it from 2 theta equals 0 if you were using copper K alpha radiation. Or in other words, like we showed you here in this um, powder diffraction, this is for a different one. This is for copper as opposed to gold. But we showed you that you know you had this peak, this peak, and that peak, and so forth. Like you had the first, second, third, fourth, fifth peaks. And there's this nice table that told you which one they ought to be. How could we have figured this out ahead of time? Well, we could have figured it out ahead of time using these rules. So the first thing is let's write out Bragg's Law. Bragg's Law says lambda equals 2d sine of theta. Okay. Now, because it's asking us for the third smallest peak in terms of 2 theta, we want this to be the third smallest. So I'm going to put the downside for a small number. This over here is a constant. So if the left-hand side of the equation is a constant, and we want the third smallest sine theta value, what do we want for 2d? We want the third largest value here. Okay? The third largest value for dhkl will give us the third smallest, or the third observed reflection in terms of 2 theta value. Okay? Now, because this is cubic, it's FCC, we know that 1 over d squared hkl equals h squared plus k squared plus l squared all over our lattice parameter squared. If you didn't remember that, you could look it up in this table. It was right here. There's our cubic one. 1 over d squared equals h squared plus k squared plus l squared all over a squared. Okay. So if we want the third, uh, third largest dhkl, the way that we achieve that is by having the smallest possible combination of h squared plus k squared plus l squared. We want the third smallest combination there. So let's write it out. h squared plus k squared plus l squared equals what? It's going to depend on our h, k, and l values. And for FCC, the rule right here is that they have to be all even or all odd. So what do you do? Just start guessing. We know that we want it to be a small number, so let's start with small numbers. Let's start with all odd. What numbers do we have? What about 1, 1, 1? Well, when you square those and add them, they add up to 3. What about 3, 1, 1? Those are all odd numbers. You add them up and you get 11. 9 plus 1 plus 1. What about 3, 3, 1? That's even worse. Now it's, what, 19. Okay? So that's getting bigger. Let's try some even numbers. How about 0, 0, 2? You can't do 0, 0, 1. Or, you, sorry, you can't do 0, 0, 0, because that's not a, a plane. You couldn't draw that plane. And you can't do 0, 0, 1, because that's two even numbers and an odd. But 0, 0, 2 works. When you add it up, it's equal to 4. Okay? That's pretty small. What about 0, 2, 2? That's equal to 8. What about 0, 0, 4? That's equal to 16. So you could try a few of these out, and you'll soon realize that we've already found the third fault, smallest. Here's our first smallest, second smallest, third smallest. So this guy right there should be the peak. That should be the third peak. We can test it. This is FCC copper, not FCC gold, but we'll still be able to see it. If we pull up its powder diffraction pattern, here's the first peak, 1, 1, 1 which was our first peak, the 111. The second peak was 200, which was our second peak, 002. That was number four. That's the, third, that's the second smallest. And the third one is 220, which is exactly what we had, the 220, which is the same as the 022, right? 220, 022 are in the same family of planes, and so it doesn't matter which one we use because you could rotate the crystal and get it the exact same way, OK? So now, the last question said, at what 2 theta value do you observe it? That's where we use Bragg's Law. We plug in d, so let's solve for d squared. This is going to be equal to um, 8 over the lattice parameter squared. So we find that d for the 2, 2, 2 is equal to, let's plug it in. Okay, when I plug that in, I get that the lattice parameter is equal to 1.44. Sorry, not the last parameter. The D spacing is 1.44 angstroms. Okay? That's our interplanar spacing. And now we just plug that into Bragg's Law. We know the radiation. It tells us that it's copper K alpha radiation. So we know the wavelength. 
we know d spacing you can solve for sine theta so when I do that I find that the sine theta for this is equal to well theta is equal to 32 degrees and we want 2 theta so it's gonna happen at 64 degrees and sure enough if you looked it up you would see that copper's third reflection starting from 0 and moving over you'd find that it is equal it happens at 64 degrees okay so that's x-ray diffraction a super super powerful tool now in the real world what do we do when we actually do diffraction you'll measure something that looks like this on a machine and then there's just really powerful search and match algorithms that basically say oh there's a whole library of known materials and they have peaks at this point that point this point it'll match it for you based off of the position and the intensity and it will spit out and say this is likely aluminum or this is likely something else okay and you can even do quantitative mixtures so if you have a material that's made up of several different metals ground up and melted together and there's different phases present we can actually do the diffraction for all the different phases and we can back out oh it's 26 percent alpha phase and you know 74 percent this other phase beta phase which is really really powerful okay so that's x-ray diffraction and how you use it um, there's lots of, I've done lots of examples on YouTube that you can watch through of this and that'll make it more clear the last thing that we're going to cover is crystalline versus amorphous materials so crystalline we've talked about all chapter that's these materials that have repeating periodic lattice arrays like for example here this is quartz quartz like a quartz a dinner glass like a fancy uh, dinner glass a quartz one it is made up of these SiO4 tetrahedra right remember that's this little it's got silica surrounded by four oxygens so you've got oxygens on these corners and you've got your little silicon atom in the center it forms these tetrahedra and you can see that they are corner shared corner shared tetrahedra and they can be nice and ordered as in crystalline quartz but they can also exist like this see these are still corner shared tetrahedra but all the long range orders gone they're just like kind of randomly smashed together on average they still kind of look like this structure if you zoomed in locally but globally that all the long range order is gone that's what it means to be amorphous when you lose the long range periodicity then you lose um, crystallinity and what sucks about that is that if you tried to characterize this amorphous material, well, the crystalline quartz material has these layers, and so there's these interplanar spacings that you can use. You can see those via diffraction, but you don't really see that here. Like, there's all sorts of different layers happening. Like, there's nothing that repeats all the way through the lattice. And so what you see if you tried to do diffraction on this, comparing the two, so plotting two theta for the two materials, the quartz would have, like, some nice sharp peaks, but the glass would just have like a really broad background and you wouldn't be able to see it. So it's actually good when you're looking at materials in an X-ray diffractometer, use a glass plate because then the glass plate doesn't give you peaks that you have to worry about. It just gives you like a little bit of a background and then your peaks show up on top of that for the material that's sitting on top of the glass plate that you're looking at. Okay. Um, so how on earth do you get both crystalline and amorphous structures? Well, when you heat something up and it's melted, it kind of looks like the amorphous structure. It's all just floating everywhere and changing rapidly. And if you cool it down quickly, it will just stay. It sort of gets frozen in time. It, it freezes its structure. If you cool it down slowly over long periods of time at high temperatures you can, then it might crystallize. So quartz, like your windows right now in your homes, they're turning into quartz, right? They're turning into something more crystalline, but it happens really slowly. You'll see like old churches from like the 17th century um, they might be crystallizing over time, but it happens really slowly and it may not be detrimental for properties or it may be very detrimental. It depends on the application. So why would properties be different? Well, imagine here, what do you think the thermal conductivity of quartz is where you have like these nice planes of atoms that line up versus here? If heat tried to move through that one, it's much harder than through the quartz. So you see big differences in properties when it comes to strength, electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity, all sorts of things. Very, very different properties for amorphous versus crystalline materials. And we'll talk more about those in the coming chapters. Um, how do you get another thing? How do you make it easier to form an amorphous material? You add network formers. You've probably heard the, the phrase soda lime glass before. Maybe you have. Soda lime glass means you start out with your glass, the bulk material, 
something like either silica, boron oxide, or germanium. So like Pyrex, Pyrex is made of boron oxide. It's, bor it's sodium borate glass. That's the boron oxide. Whereas the windows on your home are almost always going to be just silicon oxide. But you add something to it. You add calcium oxide or sodium oxide. Calcium oxide is just a fancy word for lime. Or rather, lime is a fancy word for calcium oxide. And soda is just another fancy word for sodium oxide. So soda lime glass is just SiO2 where they've added CaO and Na2O. And the reason they do that is because the charge on those, the 2 plus and the 1 plus charge, it causes these sort of network structures to form. It messes up the periodicity. It messes up the lattice uh, long-range order. And so it forms a glass instead. Um, you can also come up with other things to add to glass to change the viscosity, lots of different stuff. And we'll talk about that a little bit later this semester. So that is everything. Again, there's no class on Monday. Instead, you'll watch this video before Monday. Um, I'll be doing a review sometime next week for the midterm, which is on Friday. And I'll have the study guide posted probably by Monday night at the latest.